My name is Chris Kretzer. I'm the campus pastor. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I just want to say, for those of you that are watching right now, uh, we did make some announcements because of adjustments that were made this week. So we are no longer having indoor services, but every Sunday at 10.30 a.m., uh, right now at least for this version of what the world looks like, uh, Sundays at 10.30 a.m., we are going to be doing a live outdoor service. And so if you are watching right now and you get the idea or the, the bug to decide, hey, you know what? I want to show up there. I want to be a part of it. Uh, we're excited. We've got stuff set up. We've got shade. We're going to have some seats out there. Uh, it's going to be a really fun and just different way to do church. So that's happening today during the 1030 a.m. service. And for the next few weeks, as we continue to navigate our current um, recommendations from the governor. Uh, my name is Chris. Like I said, we are in this series called uh, this is us. We're talking about the values that we have as an organization, um, what that means for us as a church, um, because some of you have questions about what type of church we are. Uh, some of you want to know if you might be able to fit at this church. Maybe you've experienced churches in the past that, that didn't feel like it was a good fit for you. They, they did things in a way that um, didn't work for who you are, um, what you're looking for. And so uh, that's what this series is about. But it's not just informational to share like a, a brochure for you. This is also for those of us that call South Hills home. Home to remind ourselves, this is what we love about this church, and this is who we continue to work to be, because none of these things are easy or natural. They're all, they're all goals for us. They are, they are mission sta- they're, they're values for us that we want to continue leaning towards, and so um, regardless of whether you are visiting or a guest or first-timer or exploring or you have been a part of South Hills for years, um, these messages are so crucial for us to understand what does it look like for me to follow Jesus? What does it look like for me to be a part of this family? So that's what we're talking about. Um, while uh, some of these values may be new to you, um, they are actually values that we've had as a church for years. Um, and, uh, and so we get to talk about these things to celebrate what they are and to remind ourselves. So some of you may be newer to South Hills. This may be the first time you're really jumping into these things. We talk about this a lot in something called Discover. Uh, Discover is a great opportunity for you to learn who South Hills is and as well as what does it look like for you to be a part of the church. It's a class that happens just in one sitting. And so you can sign up to be a part of that. But but last week, we talked about our first value, uh, which is working intentionally to become a healthy family. I'm not going to recap everything because we have a whole sermon on it. You can go back and listen to the podcast or watch on YouTube. Uh, but it's specifically focused on how do, we, how do we continue to pursue healthy relationships and loving relationships in our family? Uh, because we know that family, even healthy families, are not without conflict. And so what does that look like for us to continue to lock arms, love each other well, and be unified in a divisive time? Uh, the reality is, is that we treat people differently when they are family. We treat our family members differently than friends, than, than strangers, than coworkers. We don't necessarily always treat them better uh, or worse or nicer or, or in unkind ways, but, but even in those moments when we don't really get along with them or we disagree with them, we still tend to treat our family differently than we treat other people. Um, you, you know, I've, uh, I, I've heard people say, you know, this type of statement before, like, you can't talk to my family that way. I can talk to my family that way, but you can't. You know, there's this, there's this difference between a family relationship and the way that we stick up and we, we f- defend and fight for each other. Even if we don't always agree with that person, you don't mess with my family. You don't, you, don't, you don't fight with my family. You don't try and cut in on my family. We all kind of have this built-in biological instinct to favor family. Back in the day, uh, which in this case, I'm, I'm referring to thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, families functioned more as tribes. There was tribes all over, and these tribes of people would all essentially come from, uh, the, you know, they would share the same ancestors, they would have a common language, a, a set of values or beliefs, and, and the tribe would stick up and protect and defend each other. And while they may have a family inside that tribe, there was still this understanding of what it means to, to defend this tribe that I'm a part of, um, the way of doing life, uh, what the responsibilities and the roles were of different people that were in that tribe. And, and I think that even though we may not have a tribe uh, mentality overtly in our lives these days, I think many of us still understand what that looks like. Um, you know, for myself, uh, the tribes that I have been a part of over the years, buckle up everybody, this is going to just be 
uh, you know, material for you to give me a hard time about for years to come. So you're going to want to take note of this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the first tribe that I, I found myself to be a part of was um, the homeschooler tribe. Explains a lot, right? Uh, no, uh, that's why I'm so smart at such a young age. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, my family was homeschooled, and, and so we were a part of this tribe of homeschoolers. And one thing that homeschoolers know is that nobody else wants to hang out with them. Uh, and so I'm joking. I'm giving a hard time. I can do that. Uh, but there was this tribe that we were a part of. We did things a certain way, and, and we felt certain ways about other people, and they felt that way about us. And as I got older, uh, I got into a really cool phase of my life where I was was super into ska music. I don't know if anybody remembers what that is. Uh, a lot of horns and dancing, and uh, and for a while uh, it was really popular. Where these like massive baggy pants, uh, w- the best ones were called Jinkos. I don't know if anybody remembers Jinkos, but it was like it was the thing. So that was a tribe that I was a part of. Um, From there, somehow, I took like a hard right turn, and I ended up in another tribe musically. I was a drummer, and I ended up playing drums in metal bands for years, uh, which is just a a very stark difference from the ska music that I was into. And and so I had long black hair, and I had my septum pierced, and, uh, you know... Skinny jeans are a popular thing now for guys, but at the time they were popular, but they didn't exist yet. They didn't have men's skinny jeans. And so some of us bought women's jeans to wear. Uh, And Rick Garvey Sr., don't laugh at me because I know that you also wore, uh, never mind. Uh, But but the reality is is that we were part of these different tribes. And and obviously I grew up now and I'm just a totally healthy, functioning, handsome adult. And that's the tribe that I fall into. But, But there's these tribes that we get and and growing up, you know, we would look at other tribes differently. I would look at the other types of people. My wife and I joke around a lot about the fact that if we met in high school, we would have hated each other, Uh, not because of our personalities, but because of the groups we were a part of. Uh, She was with the cool kids and the athletes, and I was with, uh, you know, the artistic kids and the ones that didn't need to be cool, even though we desperately wanted to be cool. And, and we would have just had a totally different approach to life. We would have never gotten along. This is the nature of tribes. This is kind of what naturally happens. So we get tribes, and, and the people of God were no different. The people of God were no different than us. The Jewish people were also called Israelites because they were uh, from the family of Israel, who was Abraham's grandson. Now, I know I'm talking a lot here, but they're called Israelites because that was their ancestor's name. Uh, Ultimately, what starts as a small family grows into a large family. It grows into a tribe of people. It grows into a nation of people. This tribe gets bigger and bigger. And by the time that we get to the New Testament, the Jewish people feel very, very clear about who is in And who is out? Who are the cool people and who are wearing baggy jinkos and listening to ska music? Who who can we accept and who do we allow and who do we keep our distance from? This family tribal mentality was never stronger than it was at this moment with the Jewish people. Who they ought to look out for and protect, defend, prefer, embrace and specifically who they shouldn't. Um, You know, the reality is that our instinct is always to favor family, our tribe, our people. Some might call this bias is a word that is a very hot topic word right now. It's It's a real thing. We all have it, Uh, and you know that people have it because if you're a parent, you have taken your kids to some sort of, whether it's a a, a tryout for a sports team, whether it's an audition for a musical, and you have seen the parent bring their kid up who uh, uh, sings and auditions for the lead role in a musical, and they don't get it, and the parent says, well, I might be biased, but I think that my kid should have the lead role, and you're like, Yeah, you're biased because your kids should not have the lead role. There's this reality that we care deeply for and defend and stick up for our family. And that's not wrong. That is not wrong at all. It's ingrained in who we are. But what is so crucial and what we're going to look at today is that our family is bigger than what we think it is. 
our family as followers of Jesus is different than what we think it is. The people that we should be sticking up for and defending and fighting for and embracing and welcoming in, it is a bigger uh, cross-section of humanity than we could have ever imagined and bigger than our natural tendencies want to allow. That's what we're going to be looking at. Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, Paul is living in this tension. He is experiencing firsthand this family dynamic because Paul referred to himself as the Jew of Jews, the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the kind of the epitome of uh, the ideal picture of what it looked like to be a Jewish man, a part of this family. And he felt God call him specifically to go out to non-Jewish people and welcome them into the family. He spent the first half of his life chasing down and killing Christians. And then he spent the second half of his life going out and inviting people to come into this larger family. I cannot imagine somebody that has experienced more clarity on both sides than Paul. And here's what he writes in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to jump around a little bit, but he says it this way. God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So we'll stop there for a second. Do you know what separated us from God? Sin. That is the thing. That is the, the one, the only thing that separated us from God. Much to your surprise, it's not that I liked ska music or that I had my septum pierced or it's not that, uh, uh, it's no no thing besides sin. That is the separation. Then he goes on in verse 8, he says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation isn't a reward for the good things that we have done because, and so that none of us can boast about it. So sin is the thing that separates us from God. Do you know what it is that gives us inclusion with God? Grace. His grace for us. It has nothing to do with my baggy pants. It has nothing to do with what tribe I find myself a part of. It has nothing to do with my, uh, my biological family. It has nothing to do with my chosen family. It has nothing to do with any of these things. It has to do with God's grace for us. That is what brings us back into a relationship with God. He goes on in verse 10. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we can get to heaven when we die? No. So that we can feel comfort while the world is melting down around us, knowing that one day we'll be able to get out of here? No. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. We are his masterpiece so that we can do the good things that he has planned for us long ago. That's why we are created new, for today. For whatever it is that you're doing today, that's why you have a transformed heart and a transformed mind. Is so that when you walk out the doors of your house or your work or your church or your car or whatever it might be, uh, whatever door you're allowed to walk in or out of at this point in quarantine, when you walk out of that, it's because God has intentions for you to do good things in your community and in the lives of the people around you. Then he shifts from God's from God's grace to this tribal, familial, relational dynamic because he knows: a, I have to let them all know that it has nothing to do with their personalities, with their families, with their backgrounds. It's because of sin that we are separated from God, and His grace that we get to be in relationship with Him. We'll set the foundation there. Now let's talk about how we interact with each other. Verse 11, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts, which 
Uh, it's a little bit difficult for us to understand, but there is like some real shade being thrown by Paul at this point in time. So when we talk about Gentiles and Jewish people in the scripture, we see this kind of differences and, and these two tribes pitted against each other a lot. Um, many times, and I've done this before too, we have talked about the spiritual reality of this. The Jewish people believed in the one true God and the Gentiles was everybody else that believed anything else. There is absolutely a spiritual component to this, but it is crucial that we also recognize that there was a ethnic and racial component to this also, because the Jewish people believed that anyone who was not Jewish was worthless. They were heathens. They were broken. God could never love them. They didn't have to interact with them or care about them. That was the dynamic. Yes, it was spiritual, but it was also ethnic, racial, tribal, familial. It was a huge deal. He's saying, don't forget that you Gentiles, you used to be outsiders, and you were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. Uh, In those days, you meaning the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. And it's really interesting because what he is saying is that they kept you excluded. Now, as you read through the scriptures, you see God talk to his children, to his people, to the children of Israel. You see him speak to them in ways, and and he says, I want you to be set apart. I want you to live differently. And, And there are times when we see these very clear boundaries get set up. The boundaries were not about interaction with other people. They were about taking on the wrong beliefs of other people. And over and over again through the scripture, we see God said, you need to welcome in the outsiders. You need to treat them as part of your family. So he's saying, you don't become like them, but you absolutely can welcome them in. So when Paul says, you were living apart, you were excluded from citizenship, and you didn't know the promises God had made, he's saying, they excluded you. Paul, Paul, excluded them from the relationship, from the family, from the tribe, from the the, the gathering of people. He said, you lived in this world without God and without hope. You were not excluded by God. You were excluded by people because you were different. Now, there were spiritual differences, but at this time, the spiritual differences were deeply related to racial differences. It was the Jewish, the Hebrew people versus everyone else. There was a racial divide that he was addressing at the same time. And in verse 13, he says, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated, the wall that, dis, that, that kept us apart, the wall that allowed us to, to throw stones to the other side. Christ broke that wall down when he gave his life on the cross for us. Remember that grace peace is what brings us into this family. Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles By creating in himself one new people from two groups. Again, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. Because some of these Bible terms and Jews and Gentiles, we've heard for so many times. And and it becomes like it, it doesn't really have the impact. But what he is ultimately saying would be, I don't, I don't know if it's crazier or as crazy, but it would be as if somebody was saying, guys, I've got great news. We no longer have Republicans and Democrats. I have now made us one. And everyone rolls their eyes. Yeah, right. How is that possible? 
There is no way. There is hatred. There is years of talking trash to one side and the other and vilifying. How in the world do you think that's going to happen? That is the closest thing on July 19th or whatever the day is. That's the closest thing that I can think of to help us understand how shocking and weird this would have been. For Paul to say, he has made peace between these two groups by creating one new group with these two different groups, these two different races, more than two different races because it was a Jewish people and then everybody else with these two different language speaking groups, these spiritual differences. He is creating one new family. He makes peace by creating one diverse group of people unified, the tribe the family was built around Christ. Not about their own physical ancestry. It was built around the grace and the love of Jesus. That is what created the new group. He brought this good news of peace to you, Gentiles, who were far away from him. Paul saying, Gentile, he brought you peace, good news. You were far away from him. Also, before you get too arrogant, Jewish people, he also brought you peace who were near to him. It doesn't really matter what side of the fence you found yourself on before. You all needed help. You all needed peace that Christ brought. Both sides were missing something. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. And verse 19 is the exclamation mark on all of it. He says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. And we treat family differently. We still have disagreements. There's still tension. We still have struggles and issues, but we treat family differently. We stick up for the family differently. We defend family differently. This is important. Who gets to decide who is family? God does. John 1 says, To all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. In 1 John, he said, uh, he wrote, Consider the extravagant love the Father has lavished on us. He calls us children of God. It's true. We are his beloved children. My loved ones, we have been adopted into God's family, and we are officially his children now. This is what it looks like for us to be God's family, to be part of a family together, to be children of God, to be unified. Even though we have massive differences, it means that we stick up for and defend and love and fight for each other in a different way because we are family. The family of God isn't just our tribe. It is not just the athletes or just the artists. It is not just the homeschool kids or the private school kids or the public school kids. It's not just, you know, one type of church or another type of church. The family of God is not just the tribe that we walk with that talk like us and think like us and look like us and act and and believe and organize themselves like us. It is anyone that God chooses to include, which happens to be everyone. Everyone has this invitation to be included in this family. That is the good news. He has brought peace to people that were far from him. And he has brought peace for people that are close to him. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, there is an invitation for you to be a part of this family. In other words, the family of God is not what you think it should be. The family of God is what it is. We don't get to decide what it looks like. We don't get to decide who's in and who's out. We don't get to decide um, who God cares about and who God doesn't. It's his kingdom. We don't get to build fences in God's kingdom. We don't get to draw boundary lines in God's kingdom. He drew the boundary lines. He set the family standard. He invited us to this reality, which is actually a whole lot like your family. 
you don't get to, t- to decide who's in your family. And some of us have had a lot of pain with that. You don't get to decide whether or not your family all agrees with you, which is why some of us feel anxiety when it's coming up to that time of year at Thanksgiving when we all sit down at a table together and we're supposed to be grateful, but we just can't wait for it to be over because what are they going to say this time? We don't get to decide who our family is, but we do get to love them and defend them and we can disagree with them and we can speak truth in love to them, but we still lock arms and stand with them. You are bound together. I've told you guys before, every night with our kids, um, we have a five-year-old and a nine-year-old now. They've both had quarantine birthdays, which I hope we just never have to deal with that type of party again. Um, But every night at bedtime, we ask them, what are three things that you're grateful for? Um, And they pretty much say the same things every single night. Um, But my younger son, my five-year-old, is on this kick right now where he's trying to communicate because he's never really, he's never been, um, he's never been mean and he's never been, he's never really spoken clearly about his frustration with people. So he is just learning about what that looks like. And so this is how it's looked over the last couple of weeks. Bedtime, go to bed, never wants to go to bed. Uh, we make him go to bed. We lay him down and say, Arlo, what are three things that you're grateful for? So if I'm putting him to bed, if it's my turn, he'll say, well, I'm grateful for you. No, wait. I'm grateful for mom and Mason. And it happens every single night. <laughs> that is how he lets me know, I am not happy with you right now. Uh, I wish that you would behave differently than you are right now. I wish that you would allow me to do different things right now. If my wife puts him to bed, he will say, I'm grateful for you. Wait, no. I'm grateful for dad and Mason. Uh, And it's just like he'll look you dead in the eyes. This is how it's going to be. This is how I let you know that I wish that you were doing things differently We don't always behave the way that our family wants us to behave. We don't always think the way our family, we don't always believe the way that our family wants us to believe. We don't always have the same stance or the same approach that our family wants us to have, but it doesn't change that we're family, and it doesn't change our responsibility to defend and to lock arms and to love each other well with grace and truth, which is what we talked about last week. That's how we navigate tension but we don't get to pick our family. God has picked our family for us, and it is wildly diverse. Paul goes as far as to insist that the church shouldn't divide or reject people uh, based on any reason. In Galatians 3, 28, he goes on, he says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You are one family. You are one tribe. Your your differences, obviously, there are still male and female. Uh, that, That didn't actually go away. He's saying that that is not a reason to divide. That is not a reason to point the finger. That's not a reason to have different tribes. We are one in Christ Jesus. He is saying, stop treating people like they don't belong. God doesn't sort and separate people the way that we do. God doesn't see divisive categories. He sees a diverse family. When God looks at us and he sees sweet, adorable, 15-year-old Chris with the baggy pants listening to ska music, (laughs) There is something that he sees in that moment where he's like, man, I love that he gets to be who he wants to be right now. <laughs> uh, when he sees the differences, when he sees the, 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 the ethnic differences, the languages spoken, the preferences of style and food and, and all of these personality, all of the crazy differences that we have, he doesn't see a divisive categories. He doesn't see like, well, that's how that group's going to do it and that's how that's going to group. He sees his children, and he sees a diverse family that all are representative of him. They all are a picture of who he is, not in full. We are all a glimpse of God's character, a glimpse of God's personality, a glimpse of who God is. God's family 
is a place where no one is allowed to be depersonalized into an abstraction. It means we, we have to treat all people like people, not just abstract ideas or categories, uh, not just different philosophies. It's not a those people or that category. There is just us. We are the family. And for South Hills, this value that we have is that we want our church family to reflect the diversity of heaven. It's our second value as a church. We want our family to reflect the diversity of heaven. And diversity right now, as we talk about it, it's very easy to think about it only through a racial lens. And that is true. But it is about so much more than just about the racial diversity that we experience. This is a diversity in all ways. I know we've talked about this a little bit over the last few weeks. We've talked about religion. We've talked about faith, but diversity shows up in so many different ways. Um, I think I told this story before, but about four years ago, maybe five years ago, I was teaching at our Corona campus, um, and uh, it's a big building, and uh, big stage and the band is awesome and they've got lights and you know 10 people on stage it's like a whole thing and uh, it's pretty loud in there Um, and I walked in service had already started worship was going room is packed uh, back when that was a thing that was allowed to happen Um, and in the very back row as far as he could possibly get from the stage there was a man who could not have been a day younger than 85 years old Uh, and he was in the back row, sitting down, and he had these giant, uh, giant noise-canceling headphones on as the band was playing. And at first, I laughed, and I just, it just, it made me laugh. It was funny. This guy hates this. Uh, this guy, it is way too loud. This is clearly, I mean, I don't know that they even had electricity when he was growing up. It was just, it's, it's a different thing, a different reality than what his preference would be. But as I started to think about it, it actually started to make me emotional because that man, I came to find out, showed up every single Sunday to South Hills Church because he loved the way that young people were coming and finding hope in a church community. I want to break that apart. What that means is that guy that clearly disliked some things strongly sacrificed his preferences and his comfort because he loved the diversity of that church. That was more beautiful to him than whatever it is that he listens to at home on his own. As we think about what that means for us, we have to recognize the diversity even for our campus. I am grateful for the older folks that are a part of our campus, even though it may not be their preference, musically or the volume or whatever that might look like. I am grateful for the the folks that don't have kids that still come to service, even though basically all of my stories are about my kids. And they deal with that. They, they, They listen to those stories and they try and understand the way that that impacts them. I'm grateful for the people that call, uh, call South Hills home and English is not their first language. And they do extra work every Sunday to to transpose in their mind what I'm saying, to make sure that they understand it, because they grew up speaking a different language. I'm grateful for the women that are in our church that listen to me say ignorant things, that listen to me teach about what it means to be a mom, that listen to me teach about how it is to follow Jesus when I'm a man, very manly, man. Uh, I'm grateful for the people in our church that have studied theology and scriptures and they know more than even I know and they still submit themselves to the teaching that I provide. I'm grateful for the 52% of the people that call South Hills Costa Mesa home that are not white people because you have to deal with things that I do like Christmas Eve services and you never had to go to Christmas Eve services before. You have to deal with illustrations and stories that that are not your lived experiences. 
I'm grateful for that diversity. I'm grateful for the people that prefer a funnier pastor or a more serious pastor. And you settle with the dad joke pastor here at South Hills. I'm grateful for the people that prefer a different style of teaching. I'm grateful for the people that vote differently differently than I do, for the people that wished that our church was still as small as it used to be, for the people that wish our church was a little bit bigger than it is. I'm grateful that we have so many different lived experiences in this church because we are better together. And when I list this off and I recognize the sacrifices that all of you have made to be a part of South Hills Church, I have no option but to make sacrifices for you too, to fight for diversity for you too. And to say, you know what, I'm going to make space for you. I'm going to make it, I'm going to figure out ways for it to be comfortable for you. I want to figure out ways to make it make sense for you too. Because you do this for me and for us. That's what it means to be a family. That's what it means to be part of God's family. What does it look like for us to embrace diversity in practical ways? Because it can be theoretical. It can be like something we agree with. But what does it look like practically? So three quick things. I don't even know what time it is. My countdown timer has said 25 minutes for at least 30 minutes. So I don't know how long I've been going for. Um, here are three practical ways uh, that we can embrace diversity. And again, yes, this is about race and every other difference that we would categorize ourselves in. Every other way you could divide us. Stage of life, uh, some of, you know, country music lovers and the rest of us, uh, whatever way you want to slice and dice, here are three ways we can practically move at embracing diversity. And it, if you want South Hills to be your home, if, if you want to call this your home, I, I hope that you would move at some of these things. The first is to pray for those who are different from you, especially those you disagree with. I did not say pray at those you disagree with. <laughs> We're not praying that God would smite our enemies. We are praying for people that are different than us, that we disagree with. We are praying for them because we love them. We are praying for them because we want to continue being close with them, because we want to, if there's tension, if there's a chasm, we want to be reconciled with them. We pray for people that are differently than us, uh, that think differently, that, that believe differently than us, because when we pray, God fills us. And when we are filled with God's love, it allows us to love people that are wildly different than we are. Pray for people who are different from you. You probably have a list of five people right now that you were like, yeah, blocked them, muted them, avoided them at the grocery store. I'm glad we wear masks. They can't recognize me in public anymore. You probably have people in your life, and you need to start praying for them. Not that God would convict their hearts and they would come to your side, but you need to start praying for them because they are your family. And as we pray for people, we start to care for people. The second way is to care about things that have no direct impact or benefit on you, which is hard because there is a lot to care about. There's a lot happening in the world. There always is. And it feels like right now there is more than ever to care about. There are more justice causes that we are aware of right now than any of us can single-handedly care about. So I'm not asking you to care about more things that impact you. I'm specifically saying find something to care about that has no direct impact or benefit on you. Something that really makes no difference in your life in the day-to-day. -day. Figure out something to care about. That is how you start to learn how to love people that are different from you because you care about things that don't matter to you. It's uncomfortable, and it can feel like a waste of time. But when you start to care about things that are happening in the other side of the world, on the other side of town and the other side of the, the belief system or the political divide, when you start to care about these things, then all of a sudden it makes it easier to start to care for the people that are different from you. And the third way is to spend time finding common ground with those that are not like you. We have got to fight for the common ground, fight for whatever it is that we share in common. For those of us that are Christ followers, that's it. 
That's the thing. That's what has allowed South Hills Costa Mesa to be a beautiful, diverse place for the last three and a half years is because we are all trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. We are very different. Uh, we have always been very different. All of the differences that we have, they're not new. But we have been moving at a unifying thing, which is following Jesus. So find common ground with people that are not like you. Figure out what it is that you like about them, that you love about them. Remind yourselves of why you care about these people. It's easy to vilify other people when they are nameless and faceless. I get so frustrated when I hear people say, Ugh, millennials. When I hear people say, Ugh, boomers. I get so frustrated with country music fans. This nameless faceless groups of people. It's easy to not like them. It's easy to push them away and to talk trash and to vilify them because I refuse to acknowledge that they have names and they're a part of my church, but they are. We have all of the categories here. So spend time finding common ground with people that are not like you. I am, I am so grateful for the diversity in our church and it only exists because we work for it. It will not ever happen accidentally. We have to work to love and welcome and embrace the family. When we sit down at the table and we like different types of foods and we're allergic to different types of things, we still sit down as a family at the table. We lock arms together, and this is what Christ has called us to do. While we may feel the tension of our differences, may we always feel the pull of Christ's love towards each other. I think they are one and the same. We feel the tension of our differences between us and other people. And every time, every time we start to feel that tension, I pray that we would, in our minds, we would imagine it like a rubber band pulling us back together as we try and separate because of the differences, the divide that seems like we could never overcome these things. I pray that we would release that and we would come back together, that we would lock arms together because we want to reflect the diversity of humanity and it shows up in every single way in our lives. Let's pray together.